golfing fans, golfers, welcome to the first golfing live session. And of course, today's session is all about psychology, obviously an area of the game. At golfing, we do a lot of technical work on swings, but psychology is so important. But it's there's also a bit of mystique around psychology. What is it? What does it mean? What can it actually do for us? What are the benefits of it? What actually goes on inside our head when we're out on the golf course? Or even perhaps when we're on the practice ground or even traveling to a to, to, to play in a medal or what have you, the things that go through our head really affect our performance, which is why during our first uh, live special, we wanted to try and cover um, psychology. And as you would have seen through from some of the posts that I've been putting out recently and the golfing team have been putting out, we're very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Philip Clark. Now, I should just say um, before I, I bring uh, Dr., Dr. Phil onto the screen that there's been a lot of changes over the past few months, as we all know, and over the past few days, there's been a lot of updates surrounding golf and being able to get out and play golf. Now, I'm sure some of you might think that's right, some of you might think that's wrong, but the reality is, fingers crossed, it's going to be uh, quite, a, quite a short period of time before we all feel comfortable that we can get back out onto the golf course. And with that in mind, I think this session in particular, um, the, the timing couldn't be better. We're going to be getting out onto the course soon. And while you might not be able to have, uh, you know, you know, might not, not might not be able to have been working on your swing much, this is the session for you to be in to try and get your head into the right space for when you get back out onto the course. Just another comment from me: if you want to comment on today's session, you will see a link at the top of the post. You will see a link. You just need to click on that. Um, just accept a few terms. There's nothing sinister about those terms. It's just to give you access to the broadcast and you can then comment away as you go. So before I bring Dr. Phil onto the screen, I'm just gonna go over, um, oh, just so you know, when you when you click to comment, that box will appear. So it's just in the post, just at the top of the post. That box will appear when you click on the link and you just hit continue with Facebook and, and then you can comment away and I just encourage you to comment as well. So before we bring uh, Dr. Phil onto the screen, here's just a little bit about him. Obviously I put this out on one of the posts recently it's a fantastic list um, of, of, of achievements, accreditations, and, and experience. Um, one of the things I personally really like about Dr. Phil is his experience, not just in golf, but across lots of sports as well. And I think when we're talking about psychology, really, we need to be using evidence-based information. So just quickly, what do I mean by evidence-based information? The Wild West is a, uh, the golf industry is a Wild West of information, so we want information that is factual and real and actually has some merit behind it and that's why we've got Dr Phil on today. So Dr Phil, there you are sir, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks very much Sam, how are you? Yes I am very well, how are you sir? Good, very good. And thank you, thank you for joining us, um, you know it's, 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 it's a weekday evening, I know you're a busy man so thank you for spending the time to come and uh, answer some, some of the questions that the golfing fans have been sending in and um, Hopefully, a few of them will post some questions as well for when we're uh, no problem for during the. Um... Uh, so just before we begin, just just tell us a little bit about you, really. Tell us a bit about your background, where you're at, what you do, how you do it, all those sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, the, the fun questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm I'm based at the, in Derby, uh, so in Derbyshire. Uh, I work at the University of Derby as a lecturer in sport, exercise, and performance psychology. Um, but I also lead the sports psychology provision at both Team Derby and the Derbyshire Institute of Sport. So I work with a range of athletes across, um, in terms of experience, but also a, a variety of sports, you know, uh, taekwondo, swimming, badminton, basketball, um, volleyball, cricket, a whole a whole host of different types of sports. And um, kind of a point you made there uh, earlier about um, having that experience, what you what you actually realize is that a lot of it's very similar, you know, in terms of the way we mentally approach mm -hmm. um, appro approach performance. So it's been quite good in that perspective. Uh, I also work um, kind of with a lot of private clients, and uh, I also do a bit of work in the uh, corporate space, uh, applying the, I guess, the principles of performance psychology to to different contexts. Because at the end of the day, you're just dealing with uh, people and performance. So understanding the role that psychology plays in that, um, you, you're able to apply it to any context. So 
actually quite a, a good thing is if you can learn these skills in terms of how to manage your mindset on the golf course, it can actually help the, uh, other areas of your life. Okay, and interesting stuff. Just tell us a little bit about, um, just before we get into some of the questions, do you think evidence-based information is important? And uh, I, think I mentioned that the golf industry is a bit of a wild west. And obviously, when we're talking about psychology, it's the mind. It's quite a dangerous place. Yeah. Where do you sit with sort of evidence-based information? Yeah, so my my PhD is in performance in golf. So um, I've got quite a lot of experience in terms of understanding some of the pressures that, and, and I guess the content around, around golf and particularly to a lot of the participants and the people I've been engaging with. You hear lots of different information about different processes for why they're doing things and I know we've had a couple of conversations where I've almost just gone, wow, um, where have they come up with that? Um, for me, it's it's so important to be able to underpin your processes and be able to under provide a really good reasoning r- reasoning or a rationale for why, you, why you're putting a certain intervention in place and before you put a, a, a different change in process in place. Mm-hmm. So... Kind of when you work within elite sport, you know, with, with elite clubs, if you're going to make a small subtle change, that coach wants to know 100% why this is being done, what's the potential implications of it, and what's the reason why we need to make that change in the first place. And if you don't have that scientific grounding, it's almost like going in, not knowing where uh, the hole is. As I'll use a golf analogy, being on the green, not knowing where the hole is, and just making a putt and hoping for the best. You know, if, you, if you're making time in terms of developing a technical skill or a mental skill you want to make sure that the time and effort you're putting in it is actually going to look to improve your performance and you can be confident in that rather than hopeful of that and that's that's where the scientific underpinning is is crucial it's so so crucial um so yeah actual science rather than uh, bro science <laughs> Absolutely. And I should just say, uh, Mike Carr, I've got, um, so people watching, I've got screens all in, out in front of me. So I've got comments and what have you flying up here. So uh, Mike Carr has actually sent in a question uh, this evening as well. He says, uh, um, uh, good evening. So good evening, Michael. I hope you're well. And hey, anybody Mike. else that's watching, please feel free to send your questions. So what I thought we'd do is let's get straight into the questions. And I think that's a really nice segue that you provided there. <laughs> actually wasn't planned. Um, <laughs> around underpinning that knowledge, around underpinning. And I think when we hear words such as underpinning, it yeah. can actually be quite, uh, I wouldn't say a frightening place, but it makes it all suddenly sound a little bit sciency and a little yeah. bit academic, and that can sort of put people off. So believe it or not, <laughs> the first question we actually had sent in, which is on the screen now, is quite simply, what is sports psychology and why is it important? So what are your thoughts on that? Now, do you yeah. mind if I call you Phil? And, and for the purpose, of, do you want me to call you doctor? Do you want me to call you Dr. <laughs> Phil? Dr. Oh, are we all right with Phil? Okay. No, Dr. Phil, no, that's fine. Just Phil will do. <laughs> um, that's fine. Um, so what yeah, is sports so... psychology and why is, it, why is it, why do you feel it's important? Yeah, great, great first question. And it's good to really set the scene of when we're talking about a lot of the topics we're going to discuss over the hour. Um, to actually give a context of what I mean here when I talk about sports psychology. Um, there's a big misconception from a lot of people around what a what sports psychology is or what working with a psychologist looks like. Uh, they instantly think, if I'm working with a psychologist, I must have a problem. And they almost think about um, lying on a bed and ta- telling me about kind of uh, family issues and, and your past and your experiences. And, and, and that's more clinical psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, sports psychology, yes, we can tackle problems, um, but it's also about performance gains and looking at trying to improve your performance and take it to that next level. In terms of what sports psychology as a area is, it's really about what I call the top three inches. So what's going on kind of between the ears? And in sport or in any walk of life, you know, we tell ourselves uh, we have an inner dialogue that can really influence and change the whole scenarios that we're working in. So kind of our inner dialogue can influence our feelings of confidence, uh, how much anxiety we have um, in terms of our drive and motivation, uh, our decision making. Um, so, for example, 
think about it in a golf context if you be if you feel like you've committed to a shot and just a second before you make the swing you change your mind and you follow through and it just totally disrupts the shot completely that's all to do with that inner inner dialogue Mm -hmm. and why it's important is because all of all performance is underpinned by that mental side and all you have to do is look at the difference between practice and competition that people who are incredible and i've seen this in coaches all the coaches I've worked with will say, I've got this player who's incredible in training, but they just can't seem to do that on when it matters the most. Mm-hmm. And and that's when the mindset really comes into play because that could be they really, really they doubt themselves or they haven't got any really structure or routine. They're quite aggressive and it can be really, really problematic. So sports psychology, I think when you look at the top 100 in any sport in the world, there's very little difference technically, tactically, or even physically between these athletes. And the psychology side, not to say that it's the most important because it's not, it's just when you're at that top level, that, or even, even at any level really, that can be the difference between the 1%. That's where you can really find marginal gains. So there's some interesting, I mean, obviously that's an interesting, there's some interesting words there like marginal, net, marginal gains and elite athletes. What about within the context of... Um, your average club golfer so we know that the average club handicap i think last time i checked was circa around the 18 mark somewhere that kind of ballpark but what what about within the context of of those sorts of players handicap players 18 handicap recreational to an extent you know might practice a little bit but predominantly play maybe on a Saturday in the medal. Is it important? Do you feel it's important for them as well? You think they can get through to training their brain, if that's the right phrase to use? Yeah, I, I definitely think, you know, sports psychology has massive implications on it, any athlete. You know, um, the reason why I bring in the elite side is I always look, even if you're an amateur athlete, you can learn an awful lot by the processes in which the elite athletes put in place. Okay, which is why one of the biggest selling industries within um, within kind of books is is audio is is uh, biographies mm-hmm. uh, or autobiographies from athletes because they they love to understand how they do what they do, and we're not necessarily reading it from a technical perspective. We're looking at it from the way in which it, it, what's what's the golden pill for what's made these guys so good, mm-hmm. and the thing the thing about golf in particular compared to the other sports. So some of the sports that I work in, say basketball, for example, is very in, in, instinctive. It's it's free flowing, so it's very very quick decision making. With with golf, because it's a self paced task, as in you have the choice on when you're actually going to execute the shot, or you've got you can make the decision to step away from the ball. It almost amplifies um, the the role that your mind can play in it. If you've got that indecision, or you can't commit, or you're struggling with confidence, that can make those ten five to even 10 seconds as you're lining up the shot and going through that process, really difficult. Um, and with golf in particular, you're only really playing. So you may have a round of golf and it's last lasting three and a half, four hours, uh, maybe longer depending on, on the course, but you're only really playing for 10, 15 minutes. Okay. And all that time in between, if you've had a bad shot that can play in your mind, or if you find yourself in which, uh, when we talk about psychology, everyone talks about the pressure of, of maybe choking or falling behind. Mm-hmm. There's also the side of it, and I've seen this with elite athletes, so it's it's common, that suddenly you're ahead and, oh, my God, I'm higher up the score, uh, the leaderboard than I ever thought. Or actually, I'm, I'm performing a lot higher than what my handicap should, should suggest I, mm-hmm. I'm playing here. And that can bring on kind of feelings of stress. So psychology is really kind of key in all those areas. So you mentioned stress there. Is this something, uh, again, okay, so if we, if we, I suppose if we use examples of the elite game, but yeah. I think all the time if we can apply it to that sort of everyday golfer. Of course. You know, um, feelings of stress, do you feel that's something that builds up during a round? Does one bad shot generally lead to another bad shot and lead to another lead to a, a blow up? It, it, was that a sort of trend that you see or, or is it depends how a person reacts to a situation. What what sort of goes on there? Did you find? I guess uh, what you, a lot of people will find golf can be incredibly enjoyable, but on the flip side, it's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> you know, because you may have practiced it when there's no pressure and everything's fine, but then when it comes to making here's this big shot, there's no real comeback. You don't get a chance to replay it. 
then it can be really frustrating when a slight error can cause the ball to go in a completely different direction. Mm-hmm. So stress can build. You know, there was a, it was quite an interesting, I don't know, um, so my wife loves I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. And I think it was last year, the year before, when Ian Wright was on it. Mm-hmm. And when Ian Wright was in therapy, his therapist told him to, to play more golf because if you ever want to test the principles of feeling stressed, you're going to experience it in golf. Right. So if you, if you can master it on the golf course, you can then apply it to the rest of um, the rest of your life. And yeah, golf, you will you will say a lot of people can get quite frustrated with it. Um, yeah, there's often yeah. a few clubs flying around. No doubt, a couple of people <laughs> listening uh, right now will be, will be guilty of that. So it, just just on that, one of the things that always intrigues me, I, um, I suppose as somebody that has worked in the golf industry and, and has known golf all my life, the, the, the thing that intrigues me most about someone like Tiger Woods isn't so much his technical a bit, and I know I'm using a, and Tiger Woods is always a bit of a bad example because he is what he is, isn't he? But any of those players at the elite level, what what often amazes me is okay, they've got fantastic technique. Yeah, we know that. We we know they've got fantastic technique, but how they cope with the pressure? Yeah, are they coping with the pressure? I don't. I, is this something? Do you feel that they've trained that they've worked for many years on very consciously and purposefully? Is it something that you're born with? Do you have an ability to deal with stress? Are some people better at it than others? What what can we learn from them? Of course, um, the one the big I guess a big thing that you uh, presume with guys when they're at that level, um, or athletes when they're at that level, that they don't experience pressure, mm. and it's quite the opposite. They they experience the same level of pressure as 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 any one of us do. What they've learned to do over the years is find ways to manage it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and use the pressure in a a helpful manner mm-hmm. so not something that's holding them down but something that's they view as a privilege mm-hmm. and that sounds very simple in doing but it's incredibly difficult to to get to that way of thinking and it does take time the way to look at it is your mind is a muscle and like any muscle you've 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 got to work on it and um, so particularly when you're training making sure that there's and I'll, we can talk a little bit about that later but having real targeted um strategies in place to to test yourself and to to work on that side of your game um in terms of are you born with it or not a lot of this relies to there's a a key word that a lot of people talk about is resilience Mm -hmm. they seem a very resilient person and people think resilience is based on whether you have it or you don't Mm -hmm. and resilience is a skill like any other that you you develop through practice and that's about managing stressful situations trying to view it and find the opportunity in that situation and really tackle kind of your beliefs and the thought structures around these types of situations. So that could be anything from your beliefs around first T T nerves. Oh, I can't do this. (laughs) Or when I'm in this situation, I can't do that. Mm. And you can, you've just got a mental block that's telling you you can't. And there's ways around that. So they definitely do work on it. What you do find a lot of athletes don't talk about using that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they, they all they all do. You know, it's ego. that's I wouldn't even say it's ego. What it comes down to, I know uh, originally when it sports psychology is it's, it's almost if they find a way of making it work for them, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily want to share the secret. All right. <laughs> give it away and give it yeah, right. Give give away a secret recipe, you don't want to do that. If this is working for you and this is taking your game and this is the, the great thing about un- unlocking your potential in terms of the way you, you process performance and the way you manage it. If this isn't an area of your game that you've you've worked on a lot, I guarantee in applying a um, a focus to your, your psychological game and your mental side of your game, you will see a, a bigger increase in, in um, I guess, your, your handicap or reduction in your handicap purely because this is based on pressure performance. Okay. You know, your handicap isn't based from the uh, the practice round when no one's really watching and it's not kind of scored. Well, it's easy then, isn't it? It's easy then. So that's that's the kind of key thing. So so yeah. Okay. So you will find I ramble a lot, Sam. So if you do feel you need to tell me to, to shut up, please do tell me. <laughs> no, no, it, it's all great information. It's all great information, and uh, there's a, there's a lot of interest. Uh, just before we move on to the next one, I, I, do you find that? people or is there ever any evidence around this uh, are certain people good at dealing with pressure or stress full stop or do some are some people better in the work environment and then awful on the golf course or 
does it does it does it vary? Obviously, you know, most most golfers, amateurs will will, will work for a living, etc. They might be able to deal with something there, but then they're throwing golf clubs. Or is there any commonality between the two? Or is it just two different environments, and that's the way it is? The, the thing that people got to remember, and this is the important thing that people lose sight of a lot, and it's a real perspective point, is that it's you. <laughs> You've handled a stressful situation in work, so you can handle stress. You can handle pressure. What's changed is the context. You may hold more importance, and suddenly that can be a little overwhelming, and we think, oh, I can't do it there. But all it is is it's, it's still you, the same person with the same experiences in all of those different situations. So it's really just trying to find out and pull apart well, what, what's worked in those situations, not from a technical aspect, but in terms of the way you run through it in your mind, what are the things in, that help you cope with it? So a lot of people will say it's practice. You know, I've, I've had experience of it. Mm. Well, then that's what you need to be getting in, in the golf side. You have experience. Is it that you like to have structure? Mm. Okay. And, and your golf game is totally unstructured. So there you're starting to see, well, you know that it works over here. So it should, by right, you should have an, a, a process with a bit of structure in there. You're going to see improvements. If you haven't got the process and you haven't got the structure, yeah, it's a big ask. <laughs> exactly. Which can often be why I think I've seen it over the years many times. Uh, you get a club championship at a golf club, you know, the big tournament of the year, and suddenly the practice ground the night before is full, and people are suddenly doing things that they don't normally do because it's a big deal. And I'm imagining that stress and the pressure, because they haven't put those routines in place, as you've just talked about, to begin with. They're suddenly changing up that routine because some it means something to them, and then they blow up because the course. pressure, it, pressure, new routine, something that they've not done before. I'm, I'm guessing I'm applying that to just a, to a, an everyday golfing context. Yeah, the the one thing we always work through with with any of the athletes I work with, and that's whether they're elite or sub elite and or recreational, is that you should never try something new in a pressure environment. Yeah. It just it, you, 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 it, it sounds like it make that makes sense, doesn't it? I suppose you battle test it, mm. um, and the problem is people think that no, no, well, I know this works, or you've spotted someone else doing it. It's like great, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this change, and the problem that happens is momentum, and and as you're playing a game of golf, if you've had one bad shot, it can suddenly start to snowball, and it can almost feel quite difficult to get your head back around on it. Um, particularly if you've had a couple of holes where you've not necessarily choked, but you've you've definitely had a real drop in performance. Mm. So yeah, always do the things that got you to the dance. <laughs> um, changing it up last minute is never good because that's saying you've changed it up for the the mm -hmm. for that specific competition. And I'd always bring it back to well, if this is what you want to do, if this is what you think is important, well, this is what we should be doing consistently. Because it's still the same sport. Mm -hmm. All that's changed is the outcome is slightly different now, or the prestige is slightly different. So perhaps a top tip is for people to think about a round of golf that they played really well in and then try and analyse what they did in the run-up to it and see what things they did maybe, behaviours or routines, whether they warmed up, what they did in a couple of days before or or something like that. Would, would that be a sort of top tip to try and... Create some consistency. So I, I definitely would be a starting block. What I'd also say to consider is on the shot that you've done well, yep. what's been what's what's made a shot good in terms of the execution of it? What are the the way to always look at it? And this is why and this happens a lot with the autobiographies. Oh, well Tiger Woods did it, so I'm gonna do it, and then suddenly it doesn't work for them. Yeah. The way to almost look at it is imagine it like a cocktail. So you're making your own cocktail and you're going to have different ingredients in it. So you really got to find out what works. So what works for me isn't going to work for you, Sam. Mm. And what works for you isn't going to work for any of our listeners. Mm. So it's really trying it. And this is what I love about psychology. People come to me with similar issues. I want to perform better under pressure. I want to do this. I want to do that. But the application of it's very different purely because you have to tailor it. Because I, I always look at, well, like you just said, find out what's already working mm -hmm. and then try and build a structure around that to help, to help, I guess, maintain that effective performance. 
See, one of the reasons I love working with you is so far you've mentioned dancing and cocktails, which sell, 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 sell. <laughs> perfect for me. Um, let's... I told you you can play it to all walks of life. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let, let, let's skip to uh, another question. Um, what causes first teen nerves and, and how can we overcome them? Quite a big question that's been sent in, but one that we know affects a lot of people yeah. varying standards as well not necessarily just beginners or high handicappers but first teen nerves so i wouldn't the thing a misconception there or a thing that you will never do is it's not about overcoming them it's about managing them okay. um the one thing when it comes to pressure is we're not going to the pressure anything that we do isn't going to get the pressure or take the pressure away what so you're still going to have those butterflies you're still going to have where you feel a little bit shaky maybe a little dry mouth a little bit tense a little bit rigid you feel quite stiff those types of feelings are are, are going to almost be there on the first tee um or in any pressure situation the key thing is how can we manage it effectively so one of the things that we always talk about in 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 kind of sport and performance psychology is get comfortable being uncomfortable and the first tee for a lot of people is the most uncomfortable so in that situation particularly if there's there's a crowd around and they're queuing to go up that can be part of the reason one is you could have had a bad last outing so that is still living fresh in the memory and we we almost what tends to happen is if you've had a bad last hole or last experience that you were on that tee it's very easy for that shot to replay in your head so it's really about trying to use the first tee. The, the way to look at it is it's, it's a fresh start and give yourself something to focus on. And that's where the routine comes in. Because if you don't give yourself something to focus on, your brain will put things in that are unhelpful, that are negative. Okay. And what a lot of golfers do is, and this is the worst thing that you could, could, could do. And it's what's known as ironic effects. Okay. is where you tell yourself not to do something, you are going to do something. Okay. You are going to do that. That's like saying, don't push the red button. All you're going to want to do is naturally push that red button. Okay. Okay. So what I would always say to focus on, particularly on the first tee to give you that, mm -hmm. or, or, or any, any, any hole, because it shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, hole, be, yeah, it shouldn't yeah, be different, yeah, yeah. is focus on what you need to do, not on what you want to avoid. Because that's giving you something tangible to, to focus on. Um, so that yeah, and the only way you right can. Have... That's a goal. I love that. That is a golden nugget. And that that's the thing. But that and you've got to think about what that is, because if you don't, what will happen is your brain will go, well, that's not that's not important. Because okay. don't have it as something that that's um, a last minute thing that you come up with. Right, I'm going to focus on this. Prepare it. Think about what is it that you're trying to do on that first hole. So whether it's in terms of um, a full swing, whether it's trying to focus on your positioning, whether it's making sure you keep your head down, whatever kind of the technical aspects, it can be useful to just focus on that. So is this distracting yourself? Not so much distracting yourself. It's it's giving direction to your attention. And, okay, giving and direction to your attention. So distraction, distraction is almost when... So and I know we've talked about it before, Sam, is say the in-between holes or in-between shots, mm -hmm. then we don't want you to be spending three and a half, four hours fully focused on a game of golf because that's not what golf is about. Mm -hmm. And plus, that's an awful lot of mental effort to try and exert. It wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I would say distraction's great in-between shots, but when you are trying to perform, it's trying to give focused attention distracted is then taking you you're distracting yourself not only from the things you don't want to focus on but also from the things that you should be focusing on because complete distraction means that you're not listening to what your body's fully telling you okay. so for example if you may feel that you're a little bit tense in 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 say your upper back uh, or your shoulders if you're trying to distract yourself from that you might you won't be able to spot that and that might change your your technique a little bit um, so yeah, little things like that. Self awareness is such an important thing for golfers to to develop. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, dare I say it, a buzz phrase, isn't it? Or or it's certainly I know self awareness is 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 very much coming up to the fore in a in a corporate environment 
I believe in education as well, sort of, you know, schooling system. Uh, schools, teachers are talking about self-awareness, being self-aware. And uh, yeah. I seem to remember reading a couple of a couple of papers and they, and they sort of talked about um, with regard to self-awareness when you're on the course, all you can sort of try and do in the moment is catch yourself, be self-aware yeah. enough to be self-aware of, of your thoughts. But <laughs> if yeah. that, you, know, you know what I mean? But actually catch I'm yourself sure. and sort of take control over it. Yeah, yeah. That that's the thing, you know. Um it is it is a buzzword and part of its popularity now is people are seeing this is where almost the um uh, the cowboys from before are telling you this is what you need to do. West. It's not a one glove fits all. It's not. Um so you have to be able to tailor it to you. And the only way you can tailor it to you is by fully knowing how you're thinking, how you're feeling, what's your normal behaviours, because they, they do link. Um in terms of the way you think, then influences the way in which you feel and your emotional response, and then that influences your behavior. So it's really important to understand the inner dialogue that you have in terms of are you telling yourself you can do something or are you telling yourself that you can't and it's quite unhelpful? Yeah. Is it quite positive or is it quite negative? And once you're aware of what that is, um, you can then make a change. I, I can't remember exactly which golfer who said it. I think it was Nick Faldo. Uh, who said, I'd rather be the golfer who's aware and can make a change than the golfer who's good but has no self-awareness. Okay. Because if you don't, your performance is going to be like this okay. because you're not seeing where where you can make changes. And like you said, right there, if I'm aware, I can catch myself. Hmm. So by catching yourself, you're then able to change your behavior because you're, you're potentially going down a, a negative route with it. And, and I guess I guess that can then become part of a routine, right? Or maybe even potentially an outcome that you want to achieve for your for that game of golf. So you know, more of a yeah. process is an outcome. You know, I want to be, I want to try and monitor my, you know, be self aware. I want to try and monitor my thinking and not worry so much about the score. Yeah, you know, just to try yeah. and and on a basic level, do you think people to sort of encourage self awareness? Do you think they could quite literally just sort of if they so people are going to be going and playing golf tomorrow, right? So do you think even to try and improve that self-awareness, they could just, right, if I can take the mindset of I'm going to think about what I'm thinking and I'm going to have a conversation with myself about what I'm thinking and I'm going to try and readjust yeah. that thinking, is that something that someone realistically could, could try and do straight away? So the one, the one thing I would say is don't necessarily worry straight away about making changes. Um, what again ties into that misconception that it's an overnight fix and mm. um, it's not what i would definitely recommend is if you want to develop your self-awareness putting pen on paper okay now i'm not saying bring bring a notepad around the course with you and after every shot write things down um but instead of having a conversation with yourself what would be a really useful thing is just listen to yourself okay. and and that sounds very weird uh, when you say it but actually don't try and change things on the course because that's, again, tying into what we were just talking about earlier, making changes to what you're already doing in a pressure situation. So what I would do over the next, um, definitely what I do with, with clients I work with, regardless of the sport, is I don't make any changes straight off the bat. I just get them to tell me through these types of activities or writing things down, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what was, so behind maybe a shot that you perform really well, even if you've got, if you have a little notepad, you can write them down quickly. Or if you have your phone, just quick jot it down. Or when you're in the, the clubhouse afterwards or at the car, kind of while that memory is quite fresh, just put down pen to paper what, what your thoughts were. What were the key things that stood out between your good shots, negative shots, or your poor shots? What did you do different? Um, so, yeah, what I would say the next couple of times is listen more rather than do and change things dramatically. Because then you'll start to already see, okay, this seems to work for me and this doesn't. And then you can start to go, right, let's focus on how we can build a routine around what you're already doing. Because what a lot of people do, and it's, I don't think it's a good way of going about it at all, mm -hmm. is they decide that starting off, I'm going to throw everything out and start from scratch. Right. And it's like, well, no, you're probably doing some really good stuff already. Yep. Let's, let's, let's look at what and start and as you, you probably do the technical perspective you look at what's fundamentally there and you just make subtle changes slowly and build around it until you've got a refined a refined performance 
Okay. Again, lots of, <laughs> lots, lots of, lots of nuggets in there because I think um, one of the skills, if you sort of take, I sit here as a coach, if, if you sit there as a psychologist, there's that gap in between, isn't there? Between sort of, and I know there's debate, you know, practitioner and, 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 and academic and, and the world between the two and being able to yeah. bridge them. Um, yeah. Again, it's, it's one of the things that I really like about what you do is, is you, you bridge those two worlds. You bring the academic into actual, try this. This will help you improve your performance, which is a real skill. Um, what I want us to do is let's just look at a scenario that was sent in to me. Um, so, yeah. so Mike actually sent this in um, to the golfing team. Um, quite quite a lengthy one. I'll read it out. It says, I was playing in Portugal last year. After 10, 11, 10 or 11 holes, I knew I was playing well and on for a great Stableford score. In the end, I had 43 points, playing off 15. However, I should have scored at least 46 or 47 points. Knowing I was scoring well made me nervy and twitchy on some two-stroke three-foot putts, which normally I would rattle in. I miss them as it happens, which cost me points. And, and for me, this is the How can I get my mindset back to where it was pre this round? I've always been a confident putter prior to this. Um, yeah. Now, if you can work your way through that one, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's that's probably, so did you say it was Mike who sent that in, was it? Yeah. Um, so Mike, that is a, I would say that is a common one for a lot of golfers. Um, a lot of people experience these types of situations and it kind of, what's great about it is that that situation has almost set out um, what we were talking about earlier, that pressure doesn't just come from the negatives, mm -hmm. you know, of what you can lose. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, pressure comes from when you've got something to win and there's something to lose. And what, what happened in terms of the winning side is where the whole story of it, it, it's hard to get to the top of the mountain, but it's even harder to stay there because okay. suddenly you're excelling. And sometimes when you're playing better than you ever played before, that's really scary mm -hmm. um, because you're not used to it. You're outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And what probably happened, and this is not to say this is exactly what happened because yeah, obviously yeah. through discussion, I, I could, we could look into that. But is you had that trigger moment that actually when you looked at the score and you looked at the leaderboard or whatever kind of context it was, you then suddenly went, oh, wow. And what, what happened there is you then probably increased your expectations of what you could achieve and all that's done is brought on um probably thinking around don't do this make sure you do this and you're trying to almost create the perfect performance mm -hmm. and what tends to happen uh, so this is where my phd came in and um, so we looked at creating pressured environments mm -hmm. to um look at how people change the performance and because golf is not only self-paced but it's fine motor skill when when you become quite proficient in that skill, it uh, it becomes automatic. So you don't think too much about it. You know what you're doing, but once you try to mentally control that uh, that process, it slows the process down. So your body, through muscle memory, is trying to put its normal pace, and unfortunately, you trying to control it. What it does is it your brain gets in the way, and that's when you get a disrupted put. So suddenly, those two three feet puts maybe a little bit of twitchy like you were talking about, that is your, your, your muscles twitching to do it this way and your brain twitching to do it another way. An example for anyone is walking, okay? You don't have to think, so I'll, trust me, there's, there, there's a, it ties in, uh, but with walking, everybody knows how to walk. You don't have to, like if you had to break it down into, so I've got a one-year-old son at the moment, you see the little processes he's going through as he's trying to learn to walk. As you get older, you just walk naturally and you don't think too much about it. If I laid a plank of wood on the ground right now and asked you to walk across it, you do that without really thinking. Mm -hmm. If I took that same plank of wood and put it 20 feet in the air and told you to do the exact same thing, mm -hmm. suddenly your whole walking would change. You'd be changing your whole process because you're thinking about it too much. Your walking would become all over the place. Okay, and we've seen that, you know, from studies. Um, so it's really about trying to not focus on uh, controlling the technique, but just focus on the tangible aspects and letting your technique 
just do his thing. And as a technical coach, I'm sure you've seen this, where in pressure situation, they change the, their putting te- technique. So is this where the importance of a routine comes in? Yeah. You know, we talk so, about pre-shot routine a lot, certainly in the long game. Um, but I'm just kind of thinking to into Mike's comment there. Is, is it even more important to have that routine, trust that routine, go through that routine, and just let that happen rather than, as you talked about, sort of try and control whatever's going on yeah. inside. Is that is that is that right? Is that a- yeah, because what, what's happened there is you're focusing on the outcome yes. and then you're, you're changing your routine because of it. Whereas a routine, the way to almost look at it when you're training, that routine should be the, exactly the same whether it's a, a, a run to golf with your mates or it's the extreme of last, last nine holes of a Masters. It's, it's still just you're overcomplicating sport. When you bring in leaderboard and when you do that, you take away, you're just adding complexity to what is a very simple sport. And that's the same for all sports, by the way. So, so to try and help him get back into that mindset where pre that round of golf, he was confident, he was rattling as he wrote, rattling in those putts from two to three foot. To try yeah. and take him back there, thinking about some of the stuff we talked about, I'm presuming that when he was at, in that place previously, it was probably quite automatic, probably quite natural and instinctive. Awesome. He was yeah. going through his routine, which he would have had, and bang, going for it. Whereas after after his bad experience, he might now be consciously trying to control and think about it. Yeah. So what tends to happen is, so I wouldn't say you. I get rid of the thought that you're going to go back to there. Okay. Purely because... By doing that, you're avoiding the situation that's what happened. Okay. okay, you've had a negative experience, and what's happening right now is, um, and this is common, is that when you're going up to to a similar situation to where you had that, you're now thinking, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. I don't want that to happen again. And you're almost avoiding, trying to avoid that situation. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say don't go back, but actually go forward, is learn from okay well what was what was it that caused you to to do that in terms of when the pressure came on what were the things that caused you to uh, what was your beliefs and what were your thoughts in that moment that caused you to to have that change in performance in the pot mm. okay and instead of trying to go back to where you are by going forward you now will have if you dive into it and really look to to reflect on it you can come out of it the other side, a far better golfer because of that experience, mm-hmm. which is why you definitely see in golf after, and all, all golfers have it, all athletes will have those pressure periods where their performance just drops. Mm-hmm. Some athletes will come out of it stronger. Other athletes will come out of it and drop. Mm. The ones who come out of it and drop is they're still trying to avoid the negative situation that happened. So whenever they find themselves in that situation again, they experience panic or fear or apprehension. And then that changes uh, the way in which they perform. Okay. And you see it a lot in putting because putting is the make or break. Mm-hmm. Okay, so even if you do a bad drive, you can recover mm-hmm. and still still make par, still make birdie with, it, with a good recovery shot. But in a put, you see it very clear as day because we break it as it's simple. It's only It's only two feet. It's only three feet. Yeah, so I'm wondering if Mike might also be thinking about failing rather than holding it 100 percent. yeah worried, yeah i'm gonna miss these because i missed them that time when i was in portugal and i hit a really good round go rather than uh is that is that is that, is that so is that what you mean by looking forward yeah so it, it's almost like you don't want to avoid failure you still want to so what probably um a certain maybe in that situation you're, you're quite aggressive with the shot in terms of you're attacking the hole mm. rather than than um kind of trying to play it safe yeah and that that playing it safe can come from uh, a fear of failure i know from some of the golfers that i've worked with they feel that there's nothing worse than going too short on the hole and mm-hmm. um, if they go a little bit ahead of it or to the side of it at least they know that they went for it mm-hmm. and and that's almost the difference between um being not so much aggressive that's the wrong word but attacking the yeah. opportunity moving rather forward than trying to, to 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 be quite defensive with it um but yeah i think just just use that experience question what can you learn from yourself what can what have you learned about yourself from that experience that you can now use 
to inform your performance moving forward. Um, but what I will say is even with that knowledge, you're still going to feel uncomfortable when you find yourself in that situation and almost question if you start having negative thoughts saying, oh, I can't do it. Ask yourself, well, actually, out of the last year, maybe seven or eight has happened like that. But you have a backlog of maybe years of where you were really confident. Focus on that and the feelings that you can actually do it rather than trying to um, look look back at the negatives. Because if you sit in that past, that past will become that present. You see, that's really interesting. And just before we go over to onto one sort of uh, another case study, I think I'm guilty of that. I tend to remember the bad shots rather than the good shots. We all do. And that's it's that's it's a strange it's, it's, phenomena. It's not though. It's not. It's really not. It's it's a common it's a common thing for humans. It's a protective factor. Okay? Right. It stems from when we were years and years ago living in caves. That if you seen a twig, if you would just brush to the side and went, Oh, they're all twigs, that twig could turn into a snake and bite you. What? So we're naturally programmed to look for the negatives and look for the threats in the situation. Um, and, I, and it's common. I'll give you an example of it right now is that, uh, for, do you know when you ever go and stay in a hotel in a, on holiday, the first night's sleep, you hear all the noises going on around the hotel. You usually say, the, it's too noisy, this room is terrible. But then two or three nights in, you're sleeping like a baby. Mm-hmm. The reason is that first night, your brain's going... A lot could go wrong here, so you almost sleep with one eye open. And then as you get used to the surroundings, you go, ah, it's actually not too bad. Okay. And you, you become comfortable, and then you, you ease into it. So it's just a natural thing, which is why we always focus a lot more on the negatives than we do the positives. It is a protective mechanism. Um, doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean that it's uh, comfortable. Okay. <laughs> Let's get up. I'm just going to move screens around a little bit. Let's have a look at... Um, if I can get the question up, bear with me one second. No problem. There we go. Oh. So, why is it very usual for me to be hitting? Oh, it's this bit. Why is it very usual for me to be hitting good and consistent shots either on the practice range or even when warming up to play? And when when I get on the actual course, this consistency deserts me. I, I, I you know, from years in the game, speaking to people, working with people at any level. At any level, and you know, I've seen it with some of the sort of like the elite young players that that, I, that I've worked with on the on the practice ground, they're winning majors. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're hitting it great. They are hitting it great. But the gap, the space between practice ground and the course, I mean, I think there is a quote that says something like the space between the practice ground and the course is the, the having inches between in between your <laughs> between your ears. You know. <laughs> yeah but but it's it's a, it's a great it's a great question it's a great scenario and yeah. what do you feel sort of happens that's with people that stops them taking that range game the practice ground game onto not the first tee but the course yeah it's the thing the thing about the practice ground is you can always replay it yeah okay you, you always have another ball you always have another chance um competition doesn't Every, every shot is counted. Every shot goes towards your score. There's pressure. And, and the thing about pressure is you will experience pressure in any situation that you find to be important. If you hold the level of importance to it, you will experience pressure. Okay? Um, in terms of how to get over that is a lot of people go where practice makes perfect. Okay? And to be honest, I hate that as a saying. Okay, because that's just talking about going through the fundamentals. Okay, perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, and th- there is no such thing as perfect anyway, but because you you can always find improvements. But that type of analogy of oh, the more I practice, the better I will get. That's that goes down to the ten thousand hours. But if you really focus in on if I, which is a controversial term by the way, <laughs> you just open up the wine and uh, carry on for a couple more hours on that one. <laughs> but, um, but if you can actually have targeted specific training sessions where you can as best possible replicate what you will feel during pressure and practice in that, you're going to get better at coping. You're going to bring that gap. You're obviously never going to be able to fully replicate that. 
Mm -hmm. But what you can do is give yourself the best opportunity to test your routine. So when we talk about battle testing, that's what we do in training. So with all the coaches I work with, when they talk about working with a psych and the stuff that I do on the court or on the pitch or on the course, the way to think about it is what is it I want? Do I want to be good at the skill, which is what a lot of people do when they're just talking about being proficient in the technical side? Or do I want to be good at the skill when, when, when it matters most? And that's the difference. And they're two different aspects. Yeah. And you want to train both. Yeah. So, for example, have training sessions that are targeted on developing the technical aspect. Where it's all about focusing on those small gains in your technical thing. That could be, Sam, I know seeing some of the videos you, you put out on, on Instagram and Facebook around some of the small technical feedback. Uh -huh. where there's no real pressure your focus is just starting to build that into your automatic movement but then have pressure-based training where there is a consequence to your performance there's something to win there's something to lose and it's not your your focus there isn't on did i do the technique right uh -huh. that's where you put your focus on what was the outcome because then that changes things okay the, and the reason why it's good to do that is the top athletes they do. They, it's not like you do hear people say, oh, don't focus on the outcome. But actually, the outcome can be quite nice as a motivator. Mm -hmm. but what they're able to do is they're able to shift between focusing on process, which is what's known as task, or focusing on ego, which is focusing on the outcome and the competition and yes. to win. So it's almost really about trying to create pressure training in your training environment. So one example that I use quite a lot with some of the golfers, and I recommend doing it, particularly thinking about Mike's scenario and, and, and the, uh, the person who sent in, in this question, is the next time you're on the putting green, okay, if, if, if the space allows you for it, is take maybe 30 balls and do 10 from, uh, sorry, five from three feet, five from five feet, uh, five from seven feet, and you do um, 5, 10, 15, and then you go, so you climb the ladder, and then you, you work your way, up, you, you, your way back in. Anytime you miss your shot, a miss shot, you start the whole process again. Okay. okay? And the reason why that can replicate it is you can't finish until you get 30 in a row. Okay. okay? Now, what happens is you will start to feel, say it's cold, you're a little tired, you want to get home, and you're on shot 27. Mm -hmm. You're going to start, <laughs> you're gonna yeah, well, start, gonna start a little bit. So that way you can start to really build in a feeling of pressure, a feeling of, God, I don't want to mess this up here. And that's when you can start to battle test your processes. I think what we'll do over the coming weeks is is we'll chuck some uh, videos out, some posts out, some ideas for how you for how you can train and games you can do when you're practising. It also, what you're saying there, now tell me if I'm barking at the wrong tree. We've had a question come in from Jez that I'm about to pop up on the screen, but is it, any, is it any surprise then, based on what you're talking about, pressure, consequence? I think quite famously, Lee Trevino grew up playing money games. He grew okay. up playing money games with money that he couldn't afford to lose. And that what is what he, that's how he practiced, that's how he honed his skills. But I'm presuming talking about consequence there was a real consequence for him at that point in his life that he was playing these money games with money he couldn't afford to lose and he had to win there's probably no real greater pressure to put yourself under than that and he became battle hardened to to that sort of um to that consequence i know it's a crude example, yeah I, but it, it, it's that sort of so, that sort of concept of having a consequence what, what I would say is, um, for those listening, you don't have to uh, to bet your mortgage to develop this as a skill. <laughs> um, but it almost ties into uh, what I mentioned about earlier in that you are the same person who's had experiences in all these different walks of life. So his experience in that world, he was able to take it and apply it in a different context because it's the same thing. Um, so I, I talk... Um, Quite jokingly with my students, they, particularly when I, when I teach on campus to 18, 19, 20 year olds, that when we talk about dealing with anxiety and pressure, you can apply it the next time you're in a nightclub and you want to go and speak to someone that you fancy because you're going to feel those butterflies, you're going to feel those nerves, 
it's the same it's the same thing you've got to work on what you say to yourself and the way in which you go out and if you go up there and you go blah, blah, rather than a, a a coherent sentence you can start to see that what's going on up here can play to it so you can definitely learn from the experiences you've had and how you've handled pressure and adversity in other walks of your life which is why another thing i know we had talked about it before sam that some of the best athletes have gone through real adversity in their life so do we want them when they were kids does that mean that that intensity that that adversity is what made them to some extent yes but we don't want to make sure that everyone has these really critical moments in their life but they've learned to deal with pressure and stress so with regard to adversity is it i mean i'm sure there's plenty of athletes who have gone through adversity and not come out the other side of it so i'm guessing it's dealing with that adversity learning to deal with that pressure learning to deal with that you know i, I use deal cope with understand use whatever yeah. it might be but understand it and then move forward a, with it that's the key so there's a very uh, simple model that helps with uh, i guess it's not so much a model it's a process when you've had an adverse situation it's what's known as the a, understanding your abcs and a is what's known as the adversity moment uh, b is your beliefs and your thoughts about that and c is the consequences now what a lot of people think is they just focus on a and c so with this type of adversity this is the type of consequence that usually happens for me this is how i usually respond and this is how I've, i have responded in the past so it's likely that this is how i'm going to respond in the future okay. when actually the thing that they always bypass is the b because that's your beliefs and your thoughts about that situation. So what was it that was increased pressure and increased um, negativity, mm-hmm. or um, you were focusing very much on what's known as unhelpful thoughts? Mm-hmm. And is it if we can change that, that will then potentially influence the different consequence because the adversity we can't control, that adverse situation can arise. But the way to look at it, and, and it's not just another thing, sorry, I'm, I may be rambling here, but um, a lot of people think it's just about being positive. It, it's not. Positivity alone is not useful because if you're in the trenches and you say to yourself, ah, I'll be fine, you're probably going to turn around and say to yourself, are you having a laugh? <laughs> like, we're not fine. We're in the trenches here. Yeah. And it's to look at it as what's helpful and what's unhelpful. And it's a useful question to ask yourself when a thought pops into your head. And this could relate back to that point we were talking about developing self-awareness the next time you're at a course is when you're just listening to yourself, do that a couple of times first, but maybe after the third or fourth time, do it. Ask yourself, is this thought that's happening right now, is it helpful or is it unhelpful? Because sometimes a negative thought and lots of athletes and well, everyone has these types of responses. If, if I'm say to myself initially, a thought pops into my head that I can't do it, my initial response isn't to go, okay, that's negative. It goes, mm-hmm. no, I'm going to prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. So now I'm actually using it in a positive way. So it's a helpful thought. But if you find that that thought causes you to get quite anxious and apprehensive, then it's unhelpful. So we can tackle that away from the course where you're in a safe environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. A lot of people try and tackle it on the course there and then, and that's really difficult. Because it's it's not safe. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring in if uh, my tech will allow me to. Okay, I've just brought in. So Jez has just put up a question, which is talking about transferring a uh, range game onto the course. W- why do you sometimes hit it bad on the range and good on the course? Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's almost the opposite side. Some, some people can really thrive in those pressure situations um, and they love that and if you take that away from them um, then it's just just going through the motions yeah I, I'd agree with that I, th- I again I see I, I've seen plenty of people over the years work with plenty of people who who do just that and there are numerous uh, there have been numerous you know elite golfers over the years that haven't really done much in the way of practice they thrive for competition and, you know, Lee Trevino was one of them. I know Stuart Appleby is a famous story when, you know, he spent all his time growing up on the golf course. That's what he did. Mm. And I think those guys thrived on the competition. That's actually where they developed their skills. On the range, maybe they just, it didn't light, light the fuse, you know. But when they got on the course. And, and, 
and that that's the thing the range is if you create that pressure into it in terms of if you're going to have 30 balls and i'm trying to land it at this place every time rather than just going through the motion see how hard i can hit it that can yeah. add to it or the range actually isn't the most effective here and actually spending no. time on the course yeah. is what's best i mean i mean obviously there's a ruck of research out there around context you know and i often yeah. say to people you know, where do you learn to drive a car uh, on the road where do you learn to play tennis on a tennis court where do you learn to play football on a football pitch where do you learn to play golf on a driving range yeah it's a different context isn't it it's a different environment it's almost a yeah, different yeah. game you know to me as a coach i'd say get out on the golf course and hone your skills yeah. and learn to play learn to play yeah. learn to swing it learn to figure out the game on the golf course what can be useful about driving ranges or, or any type of range is it at least gives you a space mm. so if you were doing technical work yes you could it's focus very much on the, it's proper practice yeah. Um, it's that technical it's got a focus it's got a target but if all your training was done on the driving range and then you're expecting to have that same type of result on the course it's not going to happen because you don't have a shield around you that's potentially going to deal with some of the wind conditions yeah. um you know all, all those types of things so yeah con context is massive um and that's self-created context in terms of the parameters you set around that training environment the environment for a lot of it is the, if you can set a creative environment or an effective high performance environment for yourself that's where you're going to get the best results and that's what we'll get some posts out over the next few weeks is is, is less technical and let's talk about how we can practice so i think really uh, phil that concludes um jez no no problem he's just said cheers so no problem jez um hope I that think, helped I, th I think that concludes our session really We've had a good hour there. Lots of questions. I feel like we could have um, gone on, and we and 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 some of the <laughs> questions that have previously you know been sent in before the broadcast, we haven't gone to as well. So maybe at some point in the future, we'll do a uh, a part two as well. Um, for those of you watching, Phil, you won't be able to see this. Let me just get my fingers right down here. You can see uh, Phil's Twitter handle there at Doctor Underscore Phil Clark. So go and check Phil out on Twitter and. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for your, all your insights. I think there's some real golden nuggets in there for everyone to watch. Um, so I'll take you off the screen now and just uh, say... Just one sec, if, yeah, I, yeah, if yeah. I can just finish. Yeah. One thing I will say, because we've given lots of information there, is don't try to apply it all at once. Um, yeah, definitely don't do that, because what you'll find is what a lot of people do with some of these tips is they'll try it all, they'll find that one part of it doesn't work and they'll throw all of it out and go, oh, well, psychology doesn't work for me. Um, so try a couple of things, practice it like a muscle, um, and instead of just throwing it all out and say it doesn't work, pick out, even in a negative experience, pick out the things that worked in it. And then you can start to build on a an, almost like an arsenal of things that you know work. And and just to let you know, Phil, we've, we've just had a absolutely fascinating question that's come in. And the question is, uh, next time, can we have some more advice for approaching girls in bars? <laughs> yeah. Miracles. Uh, I always joke around that when I say, can you help me with that? So that's a, that's a nice, uh, a good note to end. That, yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you, Phil. Thank you for all your, all your time this evening. Uh, golfing fans, that will conclude our first live special. It's been great to have Dr. Phil along. This uh, this recording will sit on the golfing page. Please watch it back. If you do want to ask any questions or if you're watching it back and you think of something, please send them in again. Um, we will, of course, answer them. Hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll do a second session with Dr. Phil as well. Um, I hope you're all well. For those of you that are going to be playing golf over the next few days, enjoy it. And as always, stay safe, stay active and happy golfing.